Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. This is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for watching. I'm Michael Hill in for Brianna Venosi. Welcome news from Washington. The Biden administration is promising states will see a roughly 16% increase in vaccine doses over the next three weeks. In New Jersey, that translates to about 130,000 vaccine doses a week split between Pfizer and Moderna. We are certainly optimistic about all the signs coming from the White House especially uh, coming out of a call yesterday in the announcement that we will be seeing an increase in our vaccine allocation as well. And I think, Judy, you know, you, you, you appreciate this more than any of us. Not, it's not just the increase, which we desperately need and we need more, but having a three week window as opposed to one week to the next um, is a big deal. This will allow us to make better decisions about statewide distribution and administration. Make no mistake, however, that we, like every other state, need greatly increased vaccine production and delivery. We just need the doses to make our program run as it has been purpose built to run. More help appears on the way to states if Johnson & Johnson's single dose candidate wins approval. New Brunswick based J&J &J says it now expects to release early data from its phase three trial next week. Once granted emergency use authorization, the vaccine would add 100 million doses to the pipeline by June. In total, the state now has administered more than 642,000 doses. More than 550,000 of those are first doses. Today, state leaders report nearly 4,000 new COVID-19 cases. Now more than 676,000 total, with 107 new deaths for a total of more than 21,200 confirmed and probable fatalities. Hospitalizations continue to fall slowly, with just fewer than 3,200 patients hospitalized as of last night, the lowest number since November. As more doses start rolling in, Governor Murphy has said he wants sites across the state to keep operating by appointment only, pointing to other states where people have been camping out on long lines outside distribution centers. That's happening in Patterson, too, ever since the city opened up what appears to be the state's only walk-up vaccination site with no appointments required. Raven Santana reports on growing concerns and criticism over the city's unique approach. Suddenly they said, if not, you're not Patterson, a residence, you cannot. I said, my God, all that trouble? I said, I'm 85. Can you let me in? Get a shot. It's been a rough morning for 85 year old Martha Wang. The East Hanover resident says she's waited in line for four hours here at International High School because she was told Patterson was allowing walk ins to everyone. The mayor said everybody can come. Her daughter Jennifer says confusion quickly turned into frustration once they were told certain days were designated only for Patterson residents, despite her still receiving this gold wristband. She begged in there and begged and was almost crying to them and they said, no, nope, you're not from here, so you have to leave. Similar complaints is what led to an emergency meeting last Friday night by Patterson City Council, where members criticized the mayor's administration for letting senior citizens wait out in the cold for hours with no shelter or restrooms. They called for an appointment based system that limits vaccines to Patterson residents. It is unacceptable to have what, what has been going on here. First of all, we're the only city that's opening it to everybody the way it is without appointments. Our seniors deserve better. The residents of Patterson deserve better. It's absurd that residents are standing online. It's just absurd to tell them they can't get they can't get their vaccination. The governor today expressing his opposition to walk-in vaccine sites. The Patterson team and the mayor is a, is a great uh, leader, and and we are very close to him and his team. Um, uh, we're, we're not wild about just show up, first come, first serve. We want to make sure we get as many shots in the arm as possible.
Patterson Mayor Andre Sea held a press conference at the vaccination site where he highlighted the city's progress despite receiving backlash for the walk-in location's long line and freezing temperatures. It's a choice to wait in line. If you really want this vaccine, you can come here. We'll accommodate you, and most people are happy from who I talked to. Like I said before, the state appointment system, people have been waiting weeks and months. I mean, you come here, you wait for hours. So it's your choice to make. A choice that most of the people who I spoke with said they would do again. Got here like around 8.30. Yes, 8.30. And I guess it's not been that long. It's better than wait for a four or six weeks for a, a get an appointment. Were you expecting to wait a long time? Yes. I would wait longer if I had to. You have to wait in line. You got. I mean, it's a little cold, but you got a little sacrifice to get the benefit, right? After vaccinating more than 6,000 people in just a number of weeks, the mayor says the city will now need to operate on just 700 doses after receiving a smaller than expected vaccine delivery from the federal government. Last week we had 2,000, this week we have 700, so they reduced our supply by 1,300. This virus doesn't discriminate and neither do we. But if we're not getting as much, we do have to take care of Pattersonians that want it. It's a week by week basis. That's how I would say tenuous the situation is. After sharing Martha Wang's experience with the mayor, he did make things right. Later in the day, we saw Wang, but this time she was sitting in a chair receiving the first round of the Moderna vaccine. I appreciate and I am thank you. It's not a perfect process, and like I stated before, I mean, there's still uncertainty on the federal level, but now the president has been very declarative in saying, we're going to get you more vaccines. The more vaccines we can get, the more people we can vaccinate. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. That UK COVID variant has killed a New Jersey man. Someone the state health commissioner said had underlying health conditions. Six new cases of that variant for a total of eight in New Jersey. Mutations of the virus have led to questions of whether we should all be wearing double masks to prevent the spread. We got some guidance on that and more from Dr. Stanley Weiss. He's an epidemiologist at Rutgers School of Public Health. Dr. Weiss, thank you for joining us. We have a lot of territory to cover here. I'm hearing so much right now about double masking. Is that necessary? There are problems when you put on a mask in terms of its fit. I think the most important thing is to get a mask that fits you well. If you feel air is escaping, uh, particularly around your nose, it's not fitting. Uh, if it, you wear glasses such as I do, and it fogs up, it's not fitting well. There are different ways to try to adjust a mask, but you may need a different type of mask. In addition, uh, sometimes if you put a never mask on top of it, you can get a better fit so it adheres more closely to your face. So that's one reason to put a second mask on. A second reason is that you've seen some masks which have a vent right in the front. That vent means that air escapes out unfiltered. So you're still protected by that mask, but those around you are not. Should we be double masking, given that all these mutations, these new strains and variants? We need to protect ourselves and we need to be wearing the mask. Uh, whatever is best in fitting you is why I'd recommend at the time. Uh, there is no reason why the new variant is different from the old in terms of a type of mask we need. Uh, the essence is having uh, protection, both for yourself and for those who are around you. Are the vaccines going to work against these new strains? The gold test on knowing whether something works in medicine, including vaccines or controlled clinical trials. So the initial trials that were done were before we had those new variants. They showed for the two uh, mRNA vaccines, extremely high efficacy. Uh, they've been looking at the immunology of those vaccines and they feel pretty confident that it's likely to offer uh, almost equivalent or equivalent protection against the variant from the United Kingdom. Are you concerned that, that a lot of people are not going to get their second dose again on time because of what seems like a short supply of these vaccines? I am concerned about the change. In medicine, you sort of know what you've done from the clinical trials in that background. We also, as I just described from the immunology, that Booster dose, I think, is extremely important. 
no one knows because the clinical trials weren't done that way, what changing the interval of time between the two doses are. So I agree with the manufacturers, uh, Moderna uh, and Pfizer, that they do not think that their doses schedule should be changed. Uh, there's divided opinion in public health because of the uh, vaccine shortage as to what you should do. I think it's better to have high levels of immunity in the people who are getting it. I think people should get a single message uh, that they should get things as it was promised and as delivered. Uh, now, if you're a few days late in medicine, very few things matter by a very short interval of time. But any substantial lengthening uh, brings you into doing things not in the realm of science, but guesswork. And we're not that good in medicine or in science on some of those guesses. Sometimes it's right and sometimes it's, it's wrong. So I would hope that uh, we would have continued adherence pretty close to the current schedules. What about pregnant women, doctor? Should they get the vaccine? What do we know about them? We actually know relatively little. There were some speculation on the internet about cross-reactivity between a certain protein that's in the placenta uh, with uh, some of the uh, antigens on SARS-CoV-2. It turns out that that does not appear to be a realistic issue and does not appear to be a problem. Uh, your, the clinical trials and other studies we usually do, we usually exclude pregnant women. And so therefore in the large vaccine trials, we ha didn't have anyone normally enter who was pregnant. There were some women who were later discovered to be pregnant. It's a small sample size, but there was no evidence that I've heard uh, that was harmful in those women. Dr. Weiss, it is always enlightening and informative to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Wonderful seeing you again. Fewer people now say they're hesitant to take the vaccine in New Jersey. That's according to a new state health department survey that finds 78% of respondents said they'd likely get the vaccine when it's available to them. The survey of about 2,700 residents earlier this month shows a major shift from mid-December when just 44%, fewer than half of those polled, said they'd definitely get a vaccine. But hesitancy still persists in some of those communities. The state health department dashboard shows low single-digit percentages of blacks and browns taking the COVID vaccines. The town of Teaneck is working to reverse that. It's put on a webinar where folks in the community can meet doctors online and ask questions and get answers. The mission to raise those low numbers in communities hit hardest by the virus. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports. It is one of the most enduring and frustrating aspects of this pandemic. The people who are hit the hardest have the least access to good medical care and the communities most at risk are all too often the ones who are the least informed about how to arm themselves. And that's leading to alarmingly small percentages of black and brown people opting into inoculation. Unfortunately, uh, we're talking about three to 5% uh, of vaccinations being uh, either black or uh, Hispanic Americans in New Jersey. And so that is concerning, especially uh, since we've seen uh, people of color impacted by this pandemic disproportionately. Uh, we see that right here in Newark. We proudly serve a majority minority community and uh, we saw the worst of it in the spring. Efforts to reach these communities whose mistrust of the medical establishment is both well-documented and well-founded are critical to wrestling COVID to the ground. In Teaneck, the mayor and council are taking a direct approach, telling people of color that they have to be proactive about their health and safety. On a Facebook panel discussion this week, the mayor and others from the medical community took questions and tried to counter some of the misinformation. We have to fess up to our history. And even though as black and brown members of that medical uh, community, we have to give the clarity, clarity and call that yes, we have not served you well. We've mistreated you, we've abused you, we, we inappropriately utilized you in medical experimentation, et cetera. We acknowledge that as a medical community and our community has not heard that at least on a consistent basis. More than a thousand people watched or shared the discussion, said Councilperson Jervon Romney Rice. 
She said black and brown residents in the township need to increase the number of the vaccinated to more closely match the percentages of those who are doing the suffering. An ICU nurse called me to say that the people who I'm treating are black and brown people. They're the ones on the ventilators. They're the ones that I've been seeing for months and, and even in the second wave. But yet when I know, when I go to get my vaccine or when I know my community members have gotten the vaccine, those are not the people that are awaiting the vaccine. Um, so there's concern. And, and to me, it's not just about the herd immunity and the fact that, well, if you don't get it, we're all still gonna get sick. It still has to be that genuine concern and trust for everyone to have equitable access to the information, as well as equitable access to the vaccine should they decide. Pick your reason, medical experiments on unsuspecting victims, a rushed approval process for the vaccine, the Bill Gates wants to put a tracking chip in your body myth, the vaccine will give you COVID or will change your DNA. Doctors on the panel have heard it all. Our focus now and probably before the vaccine was released should have been educating you know, specific communities about the benefits of the vaccine. So that way, when the vaccine is available, um, patients are, you know, accepting of the vaccine. So, um, you know, when the vaccine was being developed, we should have had a public health um, bombardment with information about the vaccine, the benefits, the risks, all the, the truth about the vaccine. Um, that way, when, you know, the companies that are producing the vaccine are ready to supply to the government, to the states, that we're actually ready to um, vaccinate our, our population. Now, if only officials could get the distribution part right. More vaccines getting to more people with shorter waits and less confusion. That might help to inspire even the rightfully skeptical to get in line. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. And coming up Thursday from NJ Spotlight News, Vaccinating New Jersey, the path to our post-COVID future. Healthcare writer Lilo Stanton will lead a panel discussion that includes special guest New Jersey Health Commissioner Dr. Judith Persichelli. That's Thursday at 4. To register for the event, head to njspotlightnews.org and click on the ad for the roundtable. NJ Transit bus riders aren't shy about asking for fixes and upgrades, but now there's a big chance to give the agency a real eyeful about what they want to need. A new online survey soliciting comments as NJ Transit plans to completely redesign almost 40 bus routes around Newark for the first time in decades. Brenda Flanagan reports so many folks depend on buses, especially during this pandemic, for jobs and transportation to testing and vaccine sites. It's critical that they get their two cents in. We have to get to uh, the COVID testing sites, the COVID vaccination sites. Um, public transit has is, is been extremely important. Especially NJ Transit buses, as advocate Janet Chernitz. It's also how so many essential workers commute to jobs at hospitals and supermarkets and warehouses during the pandemic. While office workers can avoid riding the rails, 70% of NJ Transit's bus passengers still show up at the curb. And when things go wrong, they tweet like, what's happening with the 25 from Dora, Mr. Penn? This is the second week that I end up having to take an Uber. We've been in the pandemic for about a year. Riders have highlighted that they need more buses and that they want more buses on their routes in order to get to the destinations in a timely manner. That's why Tri-State Transportation is welcoming NJ Transit's latest project called New Bus Newark. Part of the agency's 10-year strategic plan, it aims to redesign the 38 local bus routes centered on New Jersey's largest city for the first time in decades. With more than 400,000 jobs within a quarter mile of bus service here, it's an economic hub for some 165,000 riders. NJ Transit's RJ Palladino says they've spoken with Newark's mayor and with area businesses but they're also reaching out to riders with an online survey. What issues might they be encountering, whether it is transfers, whether it is the span of service that we operate. Basically, they already use our service, but how could they use it better? They can provide service all day long, but if it's not what the riders need, nobody's going to ride it. And that's really important now as New Jersey Transit tries to regain ridership coming out of COVID. Remember, they rely heavily on their fare box revenues to support their operating budget. Studies by both Tri-State Transportation and the Regional Planning Association show the agency needs to focus first on the population it serves. They're mostly from black and brown 
communities, our essential workers are from low income uh, households, and they need to make sure that they have their buses. The bus network has not been updated in decades. And in that time, so many things have changed uh, where people live, where people work, what their habits are, how they use technology. Uh, and so it's uh, it's it's critical to update the bus network to meet those new uh, travel patterns. The RPA's Nat Bodigheimer says some commuters need work shift access to new industries like warehouses, while others want more frequent bus service to amenities in downtown areas. But he said improvements should not come with fare hikes or service cuts. The ones who are still riding transit are the ones who depend on it the most and have the least alternatives. So it seems unfair to burden the budget shortfall on on precisely those people. The new bus Newark project will submit final service recommendations for the network redesign by the end of summer. It's an aggressive time frame. We're really moving very fast on this, but it's part of what we see as being an urgent need. And, uh, you know, we just are, we're, we're along for the ride and we're, we're moving fast. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Planes close officers in Newark must wear body cameras. The mayor and public safety directors say officers will do so immediately. This follows the New Year's Day shooting and killing of an unarmed man during a police investigation of a residential neighborhood shooting. A video shows a detective and the man running into each other and the detective shooting the man as both are falling to the ground. The AG's office is investigating. The new body camera policy has some exceptions for Newark officers assigned to work with state and federal agencies. One's on surveillance duties but must wear them during an arrest and officers who get an approved request not to wear them. The public safety director, Anthony Ambrose, says it's another step in building trust and transparency with the people officers serve. Ambrose, by the way, has announced he's retiring after 34 years of service. He says his successor still has a lot of work to do, but the fire police and emergency management departments are in better shape now than when he took over five years ago. Much needed help is on the way to the state small businesses. Rhonda Schaffler has the million dollar breakdown and today's top business stories. Rhonda? Michael, the state is about to roll out more financial resources for New Jersey's small businesses. The Economic Development Authority today announced a $10 million second phase of its Small Business Emergency Loan Program. This program will provide up to $100,000 in low-cost loans, and the money can be used to pay rent, mortgages, cover payroll, and other expenses. The EDA says businesses must pre-register before they can apply for the loans. Pre-registration will begin next month on the 10th of February. Developers are eyeing tracts of farmland and forests in New Jersey to build new industrial warehouses as the pandemic has created a boom in e-commerce. Local officials see these new developments as a way to bring jobs and tax revenue to their communities. But as NJ Spotlight's John Hurdle found out in his reporting, residents are worried about traffic and pollution, among other things. They're worried about their neighborhoods being turned into something like industrial parks. I mean, some folks that I've talked to have uh, um, uh, said, well, we moved here because it was a quiet rural corner of New Jersey. And so uh, and now uh, we have the prospect of a uh, million square feet or two million square feet uh, warehouse being built in our um, uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, and, and we really don't like that. Find out which communities might allow new warehouse developments by reading John's story on nchspotlightnews.org. Meantime in Newark, there is a new effort underway to reduce flight and find buyers for abandoned properties in the city. Invest Newark has launched the Newark Land Bank website. The site contains a list of the available properties that will be sold directly to buyers who register online. Annette Muhammad is Senior Vice President of Land Bank Operations. So initially, um, we will have just under um, 100 properties, and they will be spread out throughout the city of Newark. There will be residential properties, uh, commercial, uh, vacant land, um, and undersized um, lots as well. One goal of the land bank is to increase home ownership in the city. Property sales are set to begin next month. Mohammed is already seeing interested buyers registering on the website. Now here's a look at today's selling on Wall Street. I'm Rhonda Schapler and those are your top business stories. 
And before we leave you, a reminder to join us on Thursday at 6.30 p.m. for our live YouTube show, Chatbox, with senior correspondent David Cruz. This week, David tackles all things COVID-19, including a deeper look at the new strains of the virus and the struggles of New Jersey's vaccination program. Send your questions ahead of time to chatbox at njspotlightnews.org or just ask them live during the YouTube stream. I'm Michael Hill, in for Brianna Venosi. For the entire team, thank you for watching and have a safe night. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Every day, nearly 2 million customers across New Jersey rely on PSENG to provide natural gas. And every day, PSCNG is committed to doing it safely. That includes making sure you know what to do if you smell gas. A natural gas leak smells like rotten eggs. If you suspect a gas leak, leave your home immediately. Get far away, then call 911. Remember, smell, leave, call. Protect the ones you love. Learn more at PSCG.com slash gas safety. In uncertain times, you need someone who has your back. That's why at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, we make sure our health plans have all the benefits you need. More ways to get care virtually. More support for your mental health too. More tools on your phone. All in a range of health plans so you and your family can find just what you need. And we can help because everyone should feel like someone has their back, not just in uncertain times, all the time.